Before starting with my talk, I would like to understand like, how many of you are practicing GitOps in production? Cool, I see a couple of hands raised. Great. And then the next question is, how many of you are doing daily releases to the production? OK, no one? Oh, great. Right. So then I will move into uh, the key principles of GitOps. So basically, this uh, open GitOps is a CNFCF project, which is trying to help with adopting GitOps practices. So they are going to come up with open source uh, standards and best practices for implementing GitOps. So if they define GitOps principles, so I'm going to go through all these uh, key principles. So there's a system managed by GitOps, and that system needs to have a particular desired state. So this desired state can be declared in a declarative manner. So basically, it's saying what the final outcome to be, but not how to go there, how to achieve it, not the individual steps. And once we can define these desired states, next we are going to store that desired states in a Git repository. The reason for storing it in a Git repository is that we can version it, it's immutable, and then we have a series of like desired state in a uh, Git-like system. And then there are software agents which pulls this desired state and try to apply it to the system. And the next key principle is continuously reconcile. So now these software agents are going to look at the desired state and the actual state in the system. And if there's a difference, it's going to apply and reconcile so that the desired state and the actual state become the same. So these are the key principles like uh, defined by an open GitOps. So with that, I move into the key outcomes of GitOps. So the first thing, as we discussed early, so we want to release faster and release very often. And the next key thing is like you, if something goes wrong, you need to roll back faster as well. So roll back to the previous working configurations. And the next thing is like bringing consistent environment. So what we have seen with our customers is that it's not just one, two, three environments, but some customers have around 25 environments where we bring your code to the production. So consistency among these environments is very critical. So we are trying to avoid the configuration drift. And finally, every change to a system is tracked and it's auditable. So this is very important when it comes to the compliance requirements, so you can see what happened and what to the system over time. So in, in next couple of slides, I'm going to explain about what are the key features of Corio, which is delivering the same outcomes without using GitOps. So basically, we are not enforcing users to use GitOps, but still without GitOps practices, how Corio delivering these features. Then, like, you already know what is the application in Corio. It's an interconnected set of components, which is there for delivering seamless digital experiences. So it can, it can be on a single project, or it can be in a multiple project. So the final outcome is like it is there to basically deliver digital experiences. So let's see how fast we can onboard the component. So the, there are three step process. First, you need to identify what the component is, whether it's a web application that I'm going to onboard, whether it is a REST service, whether it's a task, etc. And the next thing is you have to connect that your source repository to the Corio. And finally, you have to say whether how to build it. So we support uh, build packs. And if you have a Docker file with you, then we honor that as well. And then after that, after all these three steps are completed, Corio take care of like generating the CI CD pipelines, as well as provisioning your environments, generating security policies, network policies, etc. So what that means is you can onboard new components for your existing architecture or for a brand new project quickly. 
So the outcome we achieved was accelerated development and deployment. So next thing is about like how you are going to enable, build, and deploy, uh, auto-deploy feature. We are the, as the developers, we just commit, and we want to see it's deployed, and I want to quickly test it. So we are trying to avoid the manual build and deploy process. So it's a matter of like changing a, a toggle in your Corio, where you can say, for this branch, I want to enable auto-deploy. So what it brings to the developer is like, developer can practice uh, rapid release cycles. And then, as I mentioned earlier, in certain cases, you need more than two environments. You need a series of environments. So now, with Corio, you can create these new environments quickly. So only thing you have to basically configure is like a subdomain for your environment so that whatever the endpoints, uh, components you deploy in your environment will be accessible through that subdomain. So what this bring to, in terms of out, GitOps outcomes, it's consistent environments. So you can replicate new environments in a consistent manner, reducing uh, drift between the environments. And next feature of Corio is like you can you initially connected your master branch to Corio, and then you keep on committing, and then as a result, you keep on delivering your APIs to the different environments. So let's say in the master branch or the main branch. You, you are basically working, releasing your V1 uh, API version. And after some time, depending on the like, customer requirements, et cetera, you need to basically release, uh, work on another version of the same API. So how do we do that? So generally, as developers, we basically uh, create a new branch in our source repository, and then we connect it to Corio as the new deployment track. So now what you have in Corio is, parallel deployments on different environments and exposing your APIs uh, with different versions to your customers. So what the final outcome of this feature? So it enables development, uh, parallel development, and basically multiple teams can work on their features quickly. Next thing is build. So in Corio, once the build is completed, it generates an immutable image. So in Corio, like, you can promote these images to the next environments. And this is enabling a rollback capability. For example, if something happened with the latest commit, now you can basically pick the previous build and promote it back to the production. So this is a way of like implementing rollback as of today in Corio. So next thing is about configuration management between, in, among different environments. I would say this is the, the most tedious task when it comes to application deployment. For example, I have seen like we have all the infrastructure as code, but what happens is like when you're going to apply it, you need to fill hundreds of configuration values. So I would say the easiest application to deploy is an application without having any configurations. So what Corio is going to give you is basically trying to avoid uh, generating values or uh, configuring values for different different environments. So Corio will inject the, the values for your configurations at runtime, so you don't need to manage any of these values, uh, either as, let's say, sealed secrets or references to the secrets, et cetera. So again, it is promoting consistent environment for your applications. Finally, we want to consider integration testing as a key component in your application architecture. So it's similar to like you focus on your front-end components and back-end components. We want to treat uh, testing component also as part of your application. So that's where we have introduced a separate uh, component type called Test Runner, which basically promote how reliably you can deliver your applications to the users. And final bit on is audit log. So we have a comprehensive audit log. For, for example, we can track 
who deployed this particular commit into this particular environment, and you can filter based on the users, whether based on the outcome of that particular actions. So up to now, we saw, saw that like Cori also supporting similar outcomes as GitOps providing to us. But is it sufficient? So anyone who is very familiar with GitOps will see, OK, where's my declarative resources? So how do I export out the declarative status of my applications? So that's where we identified, yes, you, it gives a lot of value, but now you need to come up with the declarative API for realization of GitOps. So the best uh, declarative API we have worked with is Kubernetes, so everyone knows about it. And then they have their own abstraction so that you, you can easily uh, configure how to deploy applications into Kubernetes. Similarly, Cori also came, uh, has its own abstractions. The only difference is Cori abstractions are very much close to the developer, so they know what the web application is. They know like what the service is. They know what's the environment, what's the project. So the, the learning curve is a bit reduced, not similar to Kubernetes. But in any platform, like it's true that you need to learn or understand this abstraction, then only you can work. So next thing is like Corio CLI release. So using the Corio CLI, we can work with on these different resources. And for example, you can say Corio create project, Corio create component, sort of things. But what's missing today is like you cannot extract out the actual uh, declarative resources back, say Corio get project minus OML. That particular support is still not there. So we are working on basically improving our declarative API to support similar approaches so that you can uh, apply uh, true GitOps. So this is the one that I want to highlight a lot. So basically, you, in a, one side, you have the system that is Corio. On the other side, you have application source code as well as your declarative resources. So as developers, you will commit to application code and then basically come up with the declarative resources for your component, project, environments, and so on, and they will commit it to the GitOps repository. And now we have the desired state defined, and also the system is there. Now, in the middle, there should be a process or a software agent which can apply the desired state to the, actual, uh, the system. So initially, this will be a simple uh, Git action for something like uh, workflow, where it will use Corio CLI to apply the changes to the Corio system. So next version of this iteration is, so we are going to come up with our own GitOps controllers, and it's going to be a part of Corio. So, so you don't need to manage these GitOps controllers further. So we are abstracting it out from the developers. So from the developer's perspective, they are going to work on the application code and also the resource uh, declarative resource abstractions. Finally, let's see what's the GitOps adoption journey. So today, maybe you are in a situation where you start with manual builds, manual deployment. That's how we start. And then next step is like you are integrating with continuous integration systems. Now you basically build it and test it, and that's how you merge it. And next, you have the continuous integration and delivery. So this is where you have to manage a particular platform. You might have to like come up with a declarative uh, Terraform like script to spawn your environments, and also you can define your application in the form of like declarative resources in the example of Kubernetes as deployment demos, for demos, etc. And then you are going to manage not only the application bits, you are going to manage the infrastructure part as well. So that's where next journey comes to the internal developer platform, where internal developer platforms are only focusing about the 
application part of it. It's not about the infrastructure. So now, how you are going to basically practice uh, GitOps in internet DLO uh, platform is that you are not going to jump directly in, into the uh, GitOps. So first you need to understand what the platform is. So initially you will use the user interface limit to our Courier console, and then you will get to know the practices, like what are the abstraction of it. And then you onboard your team to the, this internal DLO platform and keep on onboarding new projects. At a certain time, like you have so many applications onboarded to the Corio or the internal DLO platform, and the number of changes happening or releases going to this uh, production is now keep on increasing. Now there's this, uh, the, the DevOps team who is going to like look at this and trying to come up and say, no, wait, we, we, we can't like continue like that. So there are hundreds of builds, deployments going to the production. So now we need to track everything. So that's where we are going to apply GitOps principles. So now you are going to basically say, OK, all the changes go into the production now has to go through the GitOps repository. So as the developers, you will not be like doing any write operation through the CLI or a user interface. You are supposed to create a pull request to the GitOps repository. And then the, the software agents running in Corio will automatically pull those declarative resources and apply it to the Corio environment. So, that's where I see the direction of like internal developer platforms applying GitOps. So basically, more and more declarative APIs will appear similar to Kubernetes. And then these GitOps controllers like, uh, will be part of the platform itself. And basically, it's taking the developer burden of like managing these uh, GitOps controllers by their own to the platform. So that's how in the Platform uh, less landscape, uh, the GitOps going to be work. And finally, I'm going to end my uh, session with a, a, a quote from Vince Lombardi Perfection is not attainable, but if we chase perfection, we can catch excellence. 